Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Simon Shepherd. Simon is the principal of Westminster School here in South Australia. Welcome to the podcast, Simon. Uh, thank you for having me, Jonah. So first of all, can you tell our listeners about what you do as principal and what you do at, at Westminster School? That's a very interesting question. We could do a whole podcast on what you do as a principal. 
those people who are listening have probably got some awareness as a principal that you are responsible for the leadership of the school, but more importantly, you're responsible for the decision making of the school. And in my mind, that has to be very student based. So students have to be a front and centre of every decision we're making. And we need to be always contemplating how can we best serve them in, in what we're doing. So schools in the modern environment are quite big businesses and we, we apply for grants and we uh, held by EAs, enterprise agreements, and we keep on working out an HR and IR. So they're very complex organisations. So whilst you're an educator at heart, your best interest is to always serve the kids. You also have to do all the responsibility of being the CEO of an organisation. Yeah, that's um, that's fascinating, and I, I do find that really interesting for school leaders. But it's interesting how. Uh, the parallels for other industries that you just described. As an example, I was on a podcast as a guest the other day that specializes in helping optometrists who run their own practices. And it was it was funny that the story reminded me of educators, how they talked about these people who have committed their life initially. They're really invested in optometry. And then when they actually start running their own practice, um, it's it's very different to running a school, but it's the same thing where instead of now needing all the skills that have that have really helped you to succeed as an individual contributor, as an optometrist, now you're managing people, now you're managing uh, a budget and, and finance, but particularly the people aspect, which I think is um, is a challenge that I see for a lot of educators, your educational ability and skill to get to where you are initially as an educator is, is often a completely or not completely different, but uh, definitely there's a, there's a different set of skills that comes in to actually run a whole school. Absolutely right. So tell us about your journey. I'm really interested to hear, and I know our listeners love hearing uh, the stories of someone like yourself. So what are some of those moments, even as far back as childhood, that really shaped you to become the person and leader you are today, Simon? Mm, it's, a, it's a big one. I grew up in regional South Australia and my dad was a uh, regional GP, but he went a little bit beyond that. He actually qualified as a obstetrician and gynecologist, a general surgeon and did a primary in orthopedics. So he's a double qualified specialist who chose to practice rural medicine. And he believed that you needed all those skills to be a, a rural practitioner. He went on to be one of the founding members of the, rural, the College of Rural Medicine for, South, for Australia and a uh, fellow of the AMA and set up the, a number of um, the Rural Doctors Association. So uh, a person who believed that if you thought you could make a positive change, then try and do it. So at the age of 12, I got chipped off to boarding school in the city and never really went home again after that because at 17, I joined the army and went off to the Australian Defence Force Academy. Wow. And graduated from there three years later. But as I graduated, they noticed I lost some hearing and they offered me a, a desk job or a discharge. And at the time, I was quite determined to join an arms corps and do active service. Uh, when the discharge option came up, as opposed to active service, I, I took the discharge, sorry, the desk job rather. I took the discharge and then worked as a farm labourer for, for a year, contract hay baling, contract hay carting, while I worked out what to do next. And during that time, I started working on some school camps helping out the outdoor education staff and felt a real affinity to working with kids. So as that year progressed, I applied to go back to university and do my graduate diploma of education and started teaching. Then after I qualified my first year of, of active teaching, I went across to a place called Mitagundi, which is a, an amazing camp in the Victorian Alps. And at the time we had no electricity up there. Uh, we lived in log cabins and the kids had built and groups of kids would come in. We slaughtered our own animals and we serviced our own vehicles. So I was the blacksmith, the mechanic, and sometimes butcher up there. So the kids wow. would have a, day, a day's outdoor education experience, a day's farm work, a day's outdoor education experience. So that was white water rafting, sailing, with farm work interspersed in the middle. And the winter season would do cross country. Over the course of that year, in those times, um, we earned about $5,000 for a year's work. So the groups who came up, the kids from private schools through to kids from parole boards or kids from youth services who are all coming together on one camp 
and they were taken to unfamiliar environment where nobody held a social, economic, or cognitive advantage. And we got the opportunity to work with these kids. So after that, I went into the classroom and taught for a few years, went back to university and did another graduate diploma, this time in outdoor education. And then I met Susan and we decided that we would uh, get married and go overseas for a year. So we went over to the UK and eight years later, we returned from Scotland with a son. And whilst over there, I became a, uh, a housemaster in a boarding house. And we came back to Australia and basically started all over again. So I went back into the classroom, I was pretty soon in charge of year 11 at a, at a school in Canberra, started my master's of education and leadership, went off to be the director of boarding at Kinwas Wallaroy in Orange, then down to Wesley in Melbourne to become a head of senior school, up to Scots PGC College in Warwick in Queensland for my first headship, and then down to Westminster. And what sort of drove me along that journey was growing up in the country like I did with a the dad who was quite determined that he could do anything, ranging from fixing people and helping in their lives to, to running the farm we had as I grew up. Uh, I sort of believed I could give anything a crack and I still do. And so when reflecting on leadership, we've got this great capacity, particularly in Australia, to fall victims to tall poverty syndrome. And we'll criticise those in leadership. Yeah. Uh, we'll exercise what I call the empathy valve where we all demand empathy and, and sometimes it's legislated that we must show empathy, but none flows back up the channel. So instead of whinging about leaders, I thought, well, I'll have a crack at it. And instead of complaining about how, how they're doing the job, I'll see if I can do any better myself or I'll see if I can emulate them because they're so good. I'd love to be like them. And that led me into, into leadership and education. What an amazing story. Thank you for sharing uh, your journey. And uh, I want to ask you about your dad. He obviously mm. had a, a big impact on you becoming the person you are. W what did you learn about leadership from him? Sometimes I learned from dad what not to do. And sometimes I learned what to do. So he's also <laughs> a Vietnam vet, John O. Yeah. He was a, a surge surgeon in Vietnam. Wow. And then he got called up again for Timor. So he also did two years, two tours of Timor. So very, very knowledgeable bloke uh, with enormous empathy for all of his patients and everybody he took care of. Sometimes when you have a job like that, it's hard to be as empathetic when you get home because you, you might've run out. Yeah. So uh, I learned a lot from dad about leadership, but some of the tenants that, that he sort of taught me was to never ask anybody to do something you couldn't do yourself or wouldn't do yourself. Mm. Uh, most, most importantly, wouldn't do yourself. So if I'm out in the yard and I'm asking kids to pick up rubbish from the garden bed, I'm in the garden bed with them. Yeah. Uh, so the notion of, of leading by example and just do as I say, not do as I do. One of the other lessons I suppose I learned from dad and, and was refined later on in my life. I also held a commission in the Scots Guard, or sorry, the Royal Scots when we are over in Scotland. So I joined the army over there as well. But uh, we, that, that the message that leaders at last, that tenant. Now, Simon Sinek since made that into a book title very cleverly, but it is that notion. That's also instilled in you when you do leadership training in, in the military. You take care of your men and they take care of you. Uh, the way it works with your team, they'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. So your dad, uh, I suppose he taught me to give anything a go. So as a result, you know, I blacksmith, I do woodwork, mm. I do leather work, I sew. Uh, and all the outdoor red sports you can imagine. And somehow in the middle of all that, try and be a, a, a school principal. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful message. And uh, it's interesting when it comes to what, what that reminds me of is something I read recently around working genius by Patrick Lencioni's group, the table group, which is this new assessment. When, when I say new at, at right now, it's about 18 months old. Uh, but long story short, um, it's, oh, sorry, not, not working genius. I'm thinking of uh, uh, the ideal team player. They talk about hunger in the ideal team player being one of the key attributes of an ideal team player, someone who makes just the sort of person you want to be on a team with um, and the sort of person you definitely want to hire on to teams that you're leading. One of the attributes is three, humble, hungry, people smart. And the thing that struck me, uh, and you just reminded me of it with what you described here, 
is they talk about how hunger may not be as important as humility. You know, they sort of make the argument that humility is arguably the most important of the three, uh, but it's the hardest for someone to grow, to really grow in if, if it's something they haven't had instilled in them when they're young. And uh, that's why I just love hearing your story because in, uh, you know, the, the, the hunger you're talking about is a different angle on it, but that's something that must have really been instilled in you from a young age. I hope so. As, as, a, as a dad, I try very hard to instill humility in my own sons. Uh, in fact, they force me to at times uh, instill, act with humility. So if, if they succeed at something, they don't want the rest of the school community hearing about that. Whereas at other times, we'll hear a lot of announcements from parents who, who want their kids' successes to be shared with the school. And mm. we actually really want to share them. Every chance we can get to build up a student or put some air in their tyres, we'll take. Absolutely. So I'm interested to know throughout your career, you mentioned this, there's, and we all have these stories where we see a leader from afar or right in front of us do something that we think I never want to do that. Or we think, Oh my goodness, that's incredible. How did they do that? Um, any stories from your career, you know, your journey around the world really that come to mind that really, remind you of why you do what you do or, or, or were really pivotal in shaping you to become the leader you are? Well, we can go with one from both ends of the spectrum, if you'd like, uh, two, two spring to mind. The first one was involved when I was actually in the army and we were on exercise uh, in Singleton. It was a defensive exercise. So we got bus down to Singleton from Canberra and we hopped off the bus. And as we hopped off the buses, the, the captain in charge of the exercise called me over. Did Mr. Shepherd fall out? And so I fell out from the ranks and marched over to him, saluted him. He said, Mr. Shepherd, your grandfather's just passed away. Fall and join the ranks. And my grandfather was a World War II veteran. Wow. He'd been a prisoner of war camp doctor throughout World War II, was still mm. a serving member of the military at the time of his death. Wow. Uh, and he said, fall and join the ranks. We then proceeded to do a, a 30 kilometer route march to the site where we proceeded to dig in. And the captain in charge of this exercise um, knew all along that this was all happening. And I proceeded as a, as a 19, 20 year old uh, to start digging in. And we were wearing nuclear biological warfare suits and gas masks. And we dug in effectively for 48 hours straight. And then I plucked up the courage, a bit of bravery, a bit of intelligent disobedience to actually challenge him and said, sir, can you give me some information as to what's happened on this? And in the meantime, what I didn't know was my dad was calling from South Australia saying, what's happening here? Why haven't we been able to speak to our son? And one person's a lack of humility or their fragility in their leadership ability or their inability to show empathy caused quite a bit of concern. So after three days of digging in, I was put into a vehicle and asked to drive the vehicle with the, with the captain back to the base. When I got to the base, my ceremony uniform was waiting for me and I was flying home to South mm. Australia to attend my grandfather's funeral. Uh, but it had taken brigadiers to get involved. I didn't know any of this behind the scenes to pull this captain to line. So at a time, at that time, perhaps the, the army didn't show enough empathy to the men that were, were serving it and the women that were serving it. Uh, that could be borne out by some of the mm. events we're seeing now. But that captain's lack of humanity, humility and empathy really showed some poor leadership. At the same time, he exercised you know, amazing double standards. We were sleeping uh, in full camouflage concealment mode. He was lying in the open in the red sleeping bag. Uh, and you can, so you can see that's burned in my mind 30 years later. I remember this. Yeah. And, uh, and my pals remember it too. So when, when the funeral was over, I hopped on the plane and flew back, joined back into the exercise straight away. Uh, having lost mm. my grandfather, the bloke who taught me how to swim and wow. spent time with me uh, as a young bloke, helped shaping me. So that was really poor leadership and I learned that experience. On the other end of the spectrum, just a few years earlier, mm. I'd had a, a deputy principal of the school I was a student called Ray Stanley. Now, for the listeners who are involved in education, know that the deputy principal is a highly demanding role because you have to deal with 
parents and you, and you have great interface with students. You have wonderful relationships. And Ray was a genuinely uh, strong personality. He would stalk around the school and terrify you with a raise of his eyebrow, but at the same time, be concerned and help you and listen to you. And one day he asked me how I was going. And I said, look, I was in year 12. And I said, I'm struggling to do with chemistry. He said, see me on Friday lunchtime. And I thought, crikey, I hope I'm not in trouble. Uh, we were still being caned in those days. And I thought, I hope he's not going to cane me. So I went there and he said, sit down. You're doing this every Friday now. Let's, uh, let's do chemistry together. And for the rest of my year 12, he gave us Friday lunchtime <laughs> to help me with my chemistry. And, and that sort of quality relationship there where he was congruent, he was empathetic, he showed respect and he showed positive regard was absolutely formative for me and has guided me a great deal of becoming an educator. And unfortunately, Ray Stanley's only just recently passed away. I did stay mm. with, in contact with him throughout my career, uh, ringing up and saying, what do you think about this? And he'd quietly give guidance from afar. So two different examples, mm. outstanding servant leadership and quite poor, selfish leadership. Yeah, thank you for sharing those stories. Um, and that's a beautiful legacy that you, that you shared about Ray. I, I love to stop and remind listeners in these moments that, you know, just the simplicity of, of that, <laughs> giving up a Friday lunchtime to study chemistry is, uh, it's not rocket science. It's not the biggest sacrifice um, in history, but it stuck with you 30 years later and you're telling the story now. And, um, and vice versa with the, just making a call out whether, you know, that's a, that was actually a bigger decision that went, that was really poorly made. The, the first example you gave, not letting you um, be able to actually be released and not having that empathy and humanity. But um, yeah, it's, it's incredible that that stayed with you for so long. Um, what, what advice would you give to young leaders around how to be congruent? Because I know it's at its simplest, it's do what you say you're going to do and lead by example. But what have you found? How, how do you live that out as a leader day in, day out? It's, it's very difficult in, in the modern society where vicarious outrage is for by, by a lot of people and you're bent to the will of a lot of different people. So I suppose young leaders have to not be afraid of polarising people. Uh, you can't keep everybody happy with leadership, not popularship. And so you have to be prepared to go down different avenues as you make decisions and be prepared to find a reverse uh, and establish your reverse gear quite early. Be prepared to go forward and think that didn't work. Reverse from it, especially in modern society where if we take fail as first attempt initial learning, mm. we actually want people to fail and we want to have a crack at things and get it wrong. Yeah. Fail yeah. fast, fail forward uh, and keep, keep on working. So I suppose for young leaders, don't be afraid to show intelligent disobedience. Uh, can I share a story? Yes, please. When I was at the Australian Defence Force Academy, it was a little bit of a different time and we were rolling into second year. So we've had a massive amount of bastardisation institutionalised into the place and that had been going on in first year. Second year, we were pretty determined as a cohort not to do that to the new recruits. We were trying to help them through. But anyway, it came up time for the swimming carnival. A massive swimming carnival used to be held in the middle of Canberra in the open air pool. And so Powers and I thought we'd be uh, clever and we made a big banner. One of the team, Reggie, sewed together a couple of the bed sheets and we made this big banner which said the name of our squadron on it, Foxtrot, in big letters. And I'd cut stencils with some Powers and we we made this great big banner. We thought we'd just hang it off the top of the tower. And instead of hanging it off the top of the tower, we actually decided we'd go up with it. And we made some singlets as well, with an F on it, with an O on it, with an X, with a T, so all the letters of Foxtrot. And we hid behind the banner for the start of the event. And the event kicked off and started going, we had one champion swimmer in our whole squad. And his race came up and he just ploughed through the water and, and won the race. And some preordained uh, member of our squadron yelled out, 
stood up and yet give us an F. And the guy with the F stood on, stood up behind the banner and jumped off, showing the F to the to the crowd. And we kept on going, and I was the last T. And then behind me, sorry, I was the last, sorry, correction, I was the O, Foxtrot. And behind me was the T, Jono, our squadron leader, so the cadet leader of our group. And he was a terrific bloke. So uh, I jumped and get to the bottom and look back up, and there's Jono standing there, enjoying the adulation of the crowd with his arms in the air, like he's going to do a swan dive. And then he proceeded to try and do a swan dive. Now, he'd never done this before, so of course he's over-rotated and pancaked effectively into the pool below. And as we swam to the edge, there was the chief PTI, for the Australian Defence Force Academy, and a number of military police people waiting for us. And we clambered out of the pool and said, line up here, gentlemen. See me on, see me on Monday morning. That was Monday morning. Uh, that was Friday night. So uh, Saturday we went out and we uh, partied like we wouldn't be there on Monday afternoon because we all thought we were in really serious trouble for this. We spent hmm. Sunday preparing our uniforms to make sure we were spotless when we presented. And Monday morning we all marched in to see the, the chief PTI for Australian Defence Force Academy. And we formed up in front of him and he said, gentlemen, uh, whose idea was this? So I uh, informed him that it was my idea. The buck has to stop with someone. And in this case, it had to stop with me. And he said, uh, presented, said, who was the gentleman who dived off? John had put his hand up. He said, gentlemen, that was an outstanding prank. Well done. What if one of you got hurt? Never do it again, fall out, disappear. <laughs> so he knew that he had punished us enough by making us sweat all weekend, but at the same time celebrated that little bit of intelligent disobedience because we'd pushed the boundaries as far as he could. We hadn't hurt anybody. Yeah. We'd all learnt from the experience. Now, of course, the next year when we tried to do it again, the military police were waiting for us. <laughs> <laughs> and just sent us, sent us away uh, with a bit of a smile on their face with a, with a begrudging admiration for the fact that we were prepared to try and do something a little bit different, not harmful to anybody, mm. but a bit of fun and enough to raise the spirits of another 130 people or the, the whole academy who was in, in attendance. Yeah. So I suppose a... <laughs> young leaders should, shouldn't be afraid to show a bit of intelligent disobedience. Yeah, I like that. Look, Don't be afraid look to show a little bit of... different ways to do things. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mention that because um, I think... You know, it's something that I've learned a lot in a completely different realm, but in marketing and, uh, you know, in, in branding and, and realizing that when you try to impress everyone, um, you know, you, you got to, I, I like the saying, you have to choose who you, who you lose and you have to really pick where you're going to be willing to polarize. And you don't want to be purposefully controversial for the sake of it, but you want to pick the you want to pick the area where you say, okay, this is the direction we're going. And it's, uh, it's interesting that in marketing, just from a data perspective, that's where you actually cut through. And that's where you find people who become your raving fans, so to speak, but to get raving fans, you need to also be willing to have people who are, um, you know, and sometimes they're even louder will, will disagree with you. And I feel like in leadership, it's a, it's a similar, it's a similar truth. I agree with you. Absolutely. That's why as a young leader too, you have to be skilled at finding a purpose and never lose that skill. Because yeah, I like that other, pe other people who come up with the idea, back away. Don't diminish them. Leave them. Nurture them. One, um, one thing which I, I just am really interested to ask you about, because I think there'd be leaders listening outside of Australia who might have heard like me some of your story about outdoors and how you've led in that context in initially with leading camps but it seems to have been a really big part of your life what advice would you give to leaders who have never even someone like me would never really done much in that sort of space but see the potential is, is there anything any exercises that you've discovered from leading camps and the like that using out using the outdoors and and uh, to build leaders and to build teams. Is there anything that you'd comment on that? I've, I've just really interested, came to mind. I, so something you need to do 
because increasingly as a society, we were becoming more and more risk averse. And so our kids aren't learning how to take safe risks. And they're not learning any risk analysis at all because they're not being exposed to it because they're just being told no. Yeah. So when you take kids into the outdoors and you might have them rock climbing, they may perceive that they're really at risk of hurting themselves if something goes wrong on the rock. The truth is the bus trip to the cliff face was the most dangerous part of the journey. Everything else is so well managed that nothing can really go wrong, yet they perceive they're in great danger. Mm. When that happens, they have a heightened sense of emotional arousal and, and their receptors are more open to lots of things. Uh, learning what they can and can't do, approaching self-imposed boundaries, learning vicariously for what their peers can do, challenging themselves to do things they never thought they were capable of and really having a growth mindset about, I can't do it now, but if I give it a go, I might be able to. And so it's this great avenue for providing that. And then it's providing them the skills to do things later in life as well. And that's one of the great beauties of it. Uh, I still take my own son's backcountry snow skiing mm. whenever the borders are open and, and they're growing up with this exposure to this is normal. So they're learning to, to take great enjoyment of the environment, to appreciate it. They're learning how to make really clear risk analysis mm -hmm. about what's the safe thing to do. So if we have more kids who are doing things like this, maybe some of the other risks would fall aside. Uh, some of the things, the other poor decision making would fall aside because they're learning to think in the moment, in the three seconds of madness, before they think, yeah, I'll jump off that jetty. I might think, actually, maybe the tide's out. I covered that in outdoor red. I can jump off it later in the evening and the tide's in, not now. <laughs> mm, yeah, I like that. I, I can see, um, and, and I agree, that's, that's sort of where the question was coming from as well. I think... I think uh, more and more, even right now, right, as we are moving online and people are working remotely, I, I feel like it's, it's only increasing the value of experiences outdoors and what you can learn. And, and I, think it's a, I think it's going to be a big growth area personally, particularly around leadership, is to not to do things that are fluffy or for the sake of it, um, but to like where and it doesn't need to be with leadership development but even just with friends and with family like you with your boys uh for education i just i just think it's um such an important formative part of uh of education and i get really excited thinking about using it in leadership but yeah i just um i, I completely agree with what you just shared it's also if you do use it do you want to um, avoid the yeehaw experience so we're doing team building, we're all going abseiling, everyone go to the cliff, look how great you are, back on the bus. Uh, that's, a, that's a false summit. The journey experience is much more worthwhile. Uh, or a bit of hardship, which we're, we're very uh, ill prepared for nowadays. We're very prepared for every comfort. Uh, and so if we have a bit of hardship, it might not be a bad thing. So for example, if you were taking a, a group, uh, of adults on a leadership camp, I might surreptitiously remove a couple of sleeping bags. So at night, a few people are missing their sleeping bags. See what the team does about that. Because the simple solution <laughs> is unzip your sleeping bag and share it with the person next to you. But are we too selfish now to do that? Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not like if you and I were lined up for, uh, at dinner time somewhere and there was one muffler left for dessert and I was in front of you. I'd turn to you and say, would you like half of this one with me? Mm. <laughs> How many people would do that nowadays? No, I could take the last one. Oh, bad luck, John. You missed out. Yeah. Well, the yeah. truth is, the tenant I believe in as leaders is fast, so you would be the guy in front of me. Yeah. And I would be watching. And I think, let's see how he plays this one. <laughs> how is that... Uh, like this might sound like a silly question, but I don't have much experience with um, the military and defense force. How has that leaders eat last mentality been so ingrained? Is that really in the DNA of military? And is that a worldwide thing or an Australian thing from your experience? Uh, it's, it's quite Australian. And, and uh, if you've read Simon Sinek's book, he will, he will show you that the Americans try very hard to adopt it. 
but it is quite Australian uh, in the sense that you take care of everybody else. But it's also just a great tenant for life. There's a bit of selfishness involved in it too, Jono. If you are lined up to eat, say, in the boarding house and they're serving out the food, naturally the chefs will go a little bit leaner on the first serves because they've got to make sure they've got enough food left for the last person. So sometimes mm. if you go last, you can get a bigger helping as well. Or <laughs> in the situation that I'm in now, if I'm eating with the boarders and they're lined up and I eat last and there's not enough food, that, that's absolutely fine. I can go get food elsewhere. They can't. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, fascinating. I, I just, uh, I, I find your story so interesting. Let's, uh, let's jump into Leadership Express with a few more questions before we finish. Are you ready? Already. Okay. What's a book that you've gifted to other people? I've chosen two here, Jono. The first one is one I'll usually give to adolescents, and that's The Power of One by Bryce Courtney. I've lost count of how many copies I've given that away. The simple message when the, the key figure in the book, PK, gets advice very well on first with the head, then with the heart. So think carefully, make a decision, and then commit your heart to it. It's a lovely lesson. The second one was the one I gave most recently, a young bloke who was our school captain and unfortunately missed out on getting drafted. Hot draft pick, blew his knee twice. Essen took a gamble on him and hopefully has his first game this weekend. Mm. For those who are overseas, AFL is the, the premier level of Australian football. Yep. And that was Ernest Shackleton's book, South. And a, a fantastic book, or the book about Ernest Shackleton, South. Now, he was a leader who had the leadership, leaders eat last mentality. And he, he rescued every single man on his ill-fated voyage. Mm. Scott, Scott, on the other hand, believed very much in a hierarchy. Officers eat first. And he lost nearly every man on his voyage. Yeah, that's a wonderful lesson. And uh, they're great book recommendations. Thank you. Do you have, uh, here's one. What's a commonly held belief in education that you passionately disagree with? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good thing. Education can't be the panacea for everything. And increasingly, it's becoming that in Australian society. If there's an issue with consent education, schools will fix it. If there's an issue with electoral education, schools will fix it. it it's not really what schools are equipped to do. We'll do our utmost. But when a teacher does a degree in, say, for example, economics, then does a graduate diploma of education and becomes a teacher, at no time are they being taught the soft skills of teaching kids about consent. If there's an issue with a drug, schools will fix it. Mm. It, takes, it takes a village to raise a child and it cannot all be palmed off onto the school. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's a great piece of advice you've received? Well, it's one which is a reminder of recently. You can probably tell already I'm quite a passionate person. And uh, in the jobs that you're in as a principal, you make lots of decisions and you think quick. And so I got reminded to listen to listen, don't listen to respond. Mm. And that was a lovely, a lovely piece of advice from someone who's quite a bit younger than me, just reminded me that. I thought, well done, really, really respected person who's going to show that intelligence, mm. disobedience, the bravery to say something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, actually. I don't think I've heard it. A phrase like that listen to listen don't listen to don't listen just to respond listen to listen yeah that's um that really hits at it i love it uh what about a question i, I always love to ask people if they have a favorite question when you're in a one-on-one -on -one, when you're with a team are there any questions that you find simon tends to ask <laughs> well most meetings start with how are you and it's a genuine question which the person <laughs> goes to as much depth, depth as they want to uh, so I will, I will usually start most meetings with something really simple. How are you? If I have a bit more insight to the person's life, then it will probably be around a point, a passion point for them to give them the opportunity to, to speak and open up and feel great. Absolutely. Um, no, that's a good question. A movie or TV show that really impacted you? Uh, are you ready for a laugh? Yep. The Princess, <laughs> the princess Bride. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I haven't had that yet, and uh, 
Now I think about it, I'm surprised. So you're the first person to recommend that in about 90 episodes. And it's, <laughs> yeah, is, is, it, is it purely because of the humor of it? Or is there anything else about it that really, that you loved? I love the friendship between uh, Fezzik and, and my, I think it's Dago Montana, uh, the friendship they had and, and that genuine relationship where they cared for each other. And of course, the theme of the music, uh, the theme of the, the movie is lovely. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's about love. And the soundtrack's written by Mark Knopfler. So it's, it's amazing soundtrack. Oh, that's awesome. Princess Bride. Love it. So um, let me just have a look. What else? Oh, a, are there any quotes? You've mentioned a few, but do you have any other quotes that you really love around life or leadership? There, there are two. Do you know, I'm sorry I do it to you again. The first one's St. Francis of Assisi, uh, an exceptionally giving, generous and intelligent person. He said, first do what's necessary, then do what's possible and soon you'll be doing the impossible. And mm. we all have to remember that. Let's just do what's necessary first and not stress about anything else. Do that first. Then do what's possible, then you'll be doing the impossible. And the second one mm. is, is a fantastic quote. Follow me, I'm right behind you. <laughs> so that's, that's not out of cowardice. That's out of saying, I have faith. You have faith. We can do it. I'm just here. Go exploring. Yeah. And that's the sort of same tenet you use when you take kids into the outdoors. Follow me, I'm right behind you. <laughs> we've got we've got your back. Yeah. That's great. They're both wonderful quotes. Thank you. Uh, last question. If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Don't allow yourself to be paralyzed by fear. Make mm. the right decision, make the wrong decision, don't make no decision. <laughs> yeah that's good well for those who have really enjoyed today where can they find you online and, and maybe find out more about uh, your school Westminster as well uh, obviously you can find me at Westminster School I'm on the website uh, and there's a little intro introduction to the to the school there hopefully you'll see it's congruent to how I've spoken today and of course you can email me through um, WS at westminster.school and I'm very happy to talk to people. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Um, I know particularly those out of Australia, I feel like this has been, uh, it's just been great that obviously Simon's very well traveled, but just, just a real Aussie episode, I feel like anyway. And I think just <laughs> great chatting about the outback and, and, and leadership. And yeah, it's just been uh it's just been a joy and so for our listeners don't forget i also have the john o white leadership podcast which is more traditional uh leadership tips on how to build a high performance team those sort of things and leadership question of the day where i ask you a different question every day to put a stone in your shoe and make you uncomfortable to grow as a leader uh, but i want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to simon for being so generous with your time uh for telling amazing stories and wonderful quotes and uh, yeah, I feel like you've challenged me in the best way today. I've got a lot of things running around my brain and, and uh, some wonderful challenging quotes. It's been a real joy. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. I hope it's been useful for someone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. 
I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John White or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time. 